In this uh, scenario, we're going to demonstrate a remote booting of a malicious operating system uh, using a PXE or pre-boot execution environment um, uh, facilitated through dynamic host configuration protocol. Uh, you know, it's just something that's standard, it's been around for ages, um, PXE for that matter and DHCP. And what we're going to do is we're just going to modify an existing, you know, Linux environment to to facilitate on nefarious um, purposes. So how does this scenario play out? We have a compromised um, access point or home router environment, for example, and we have a victim sitting behind that uh, compromised AP or home router, and um, you know, our attacker controls that access point. So what we're going to do is our attacker is remote somewhere, doesn't have to be on the, on the same network as this uh, victim. And what we're going to do is uh, modify the DHCP um, settings of that uh, compromised home router. And if that victim uh, supports uh, PXE boot at uh, startups, so in other words, there's a, there is a specific scenario requirement here where the victim's machine must have PXE uh, requesting um, at boot time. So in other words, before the main operating system starts up, PXE needs to be probed and at least, you know, asked for it is potentially possible that you know that uh, this can happen uh, some legacy environments you know where you have home router uh, with old windows machines or you know other machines it devices sitting around uh, for that matter but in any any especially old pcs for example can have this scenario where we could uh, you know, first it's first probes for a PXE boot if if it can't find the the disk, uh, for example. But in case where there's uh, the PXE starts up before the main operating system, you know, this this scenario demonstrate how that's possible for one. So a bit contrived, but it is possible. Uh, it would also not work in 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 specific environments with uh, EFI boot. So uh, this scenario is a lot more specific to BIOS type setups. Uh, so EFI boot is not necessarily, or UFI is not going to be affected by this because the so the bootloaders, et cetera, are signed. Um, so it's not necessarily applicable. But for uh, demonstration purposes, let's see how this would play out, right? Um, continuing with our attack scenario, we see that the attacker wants to get access to the victim's machine. Um, you, you know, once we've booted our malicious OS and from there we can do whatever we want, pivot into the rest of the network, um, or, you know, if there's a disk attached to this um, to this victim machine, we could, you know, mess with that as well if we want to. So next, let's look at how this is going to, you know, what is required for this type of setup. Uh, the tools we use, uh, you know, it's a couple of things, so it's not straightforward. Uh, in this case, we, for this demonstration, we're going to use just a virtual environment with two virtual machines. One's going to run a Windows host. And on this Windows host, we already have an operating system set up, et cetera, users already there. So it's a legitimate operating system running. Windows is um, going to be our victim machine. And then we have a Linux host, that, which is our attacker machine, sitting on the same network. The Linux host is going to be responsible for uh, serving all the content to this um, to this host. Next, so basically how this is set up, you can see it's just straightforward. Nothing, you know, complicated victim host, uh, victim and attacker on the same network in a virtual environment. Um, so on the Linux host, we require a specific tool called DNS mask. Now, DNS mask is found on many home routers. Um, it is, you know, it's quite ubiquitous. It's a Swiss army knife of these type of environments. Because it's small, compact, and very feature-rich, uh, you'll, you'll if you scratch around on most home routers, you'll find this utility or this service present. And it's responsible for managing uh, DNS, ma managing... Uh, uh, all sorts of other features, as well as DHCP, which is a dynamic host configuration protocol. So if you look at that uh, from this point of, you know, from the configuration point of view, we'll see that, you know, this is just the basic configuration file for this DNS mask service we are running here. We see we've even enabled TFTP, 
Now, Travel FTP is important uh, for serving our initial PXE uh, bootloader. Uh, and this is a feature that's available in DNS Mask. So that's why I'm saying this is a Swiss Army knife. And we're going to tell the TFT, uh, TFTP boot server to load from that file location. We're going to have some files there that we're going to serve through TFTP as well as other, uh, P, uh, HTTP. Um, this LPXE uh, Linux.0 file is going to be our initial loader that's going to kick this off. And um, it's going to be, uh, you know, kicks off the whole chain. It's all done through TFTP uh, on the initial startup phase. But what's important is these following two options. Option 209 is basically, um, you know, a configuration meta or meta file, but it's more like a configuration file for our um, Linux kernel to boot or before the Linux kernel can boot. And this is used uh, by LPX uh, e Linux as well as another file. We'll see LD, uh, LD Linux as well. Uh, that starts off this whole process. It kickstarts off this whole chain of events. Um, and then you'll see the next option here, 2010, is a URL. Now, this URL is going to be the base URL that's going to be used by the fetcher of this. Um, LPXE Linux um, plus its um, ancillary module that um, will then go fetch this option 209 that we just saw. Uh, so everything is basically then based reference of, of that. Okay, so now let's run the, let's just start this uh, DNS mask uh, service and it's running in the background. We can fire and forget, it's just sitting there. Um, once we've run it, uh, let's look at, you know, this uh, TFTP server lo uh, file system location. I'm just dumping all the contents here so you can see all the files that we're going to inspect. Um, so pay attention uh, to this PXE Linux file that uh, I just spoke about earlier. In here, it's going to reference a couple of URLs. Okay, so here we can see the VM Linux um, URL that's going to, you know, it's refused to refer to the Linux kernel that's going to be loaded uh, remotely over the network. Um, next, we see the um, initial um, RAM disk image that's going to be loaded as part of the, you know, the initial in memory file system. Um, that will eventually lead us to go and fetch this uh, file system. Um, this file system here is called uh, it's Squash FS. It's a type of compressed uh, file system that uh, contains the bigger operating system. In other words, you know, my, uh, all the utilities and everything, all the Linux kernel modules, etc. In this case, it's the gparted one, which is quite a bit bigger than the normal, um, you know, VM Linux or even the initial RAM disk image we just saw earlier. Uh, so this is the one of the last steps that's uh, actually going to uh, get uh, downloaded and it ex extracts this into memory as well. So everything's going to run in memory and that uh, we'll see later. We're going to modify the squash uh, FS uh, file system uh, image to contain our uh, reverse shell uh, or reverse connection basically. Um, next, let's look at the web server. Uh, we're going to use a web server to serve this content uh, in addition to the DNS masks uh, TFTP server. The web server we're going to use is just a plain old Python uh, web server. Nothing fancy. Um, it just use serves the content uh, from the local directory. Um, in this case, it'll be those uh, couple of files that's going to be loaded. The, the you know, the uh, PXE Linux uh, default file, the VM Linus, init RT image, uh, etc., as well as the file system uh, squash uh, image as well. Let's look at uh, gparted ISO. Uh, this is the image that we're going to use for our live OS boot uh, of, of a Linux image. Uh, I'm using this, we, we are using this because it is already made for a live boot environment and um, it also, with our tweaking, can uh, can boot over a network, which is quite handy. Um, and it also has the ability to 
you know, file system utilities that we need, such as FDisk uh, and the ability to mount uh, Windows NTFS file systems, which is quite handy for us as uh, attackers, in this case, trying to get access to a Windows, you know, file system. Uh, basically, we use this project here, the gparted.org. Um, here's the whole live PXE page uh, that they, on the wiki, on the describes how to do all the things that I just uh, spoke about. So I used a lot of inspiration from this. Straightforward, just download the stuff, extract it and modify as needed, um, and then, you know, launch, and there you go. You can boot a PXE image. Uh, but it's not always that straightforward took me quite a bit of uh, tinkering to get going. All right, so let's look at the ISO. Uh, we need to extract some files from that ISO so that we can get this PXE image to boot. So we downloaded the uh, ISO from their website and we're mounting it in Linux with a loopback uh, interface. And basically what we're gonna look at, we're we interested in this uh, live folder inside this ISO. You're gonna, you'll notice there's already the file system dot squash FS as well as the initial RAM disk image and the VM liners disk that we also want. What's missing from this image is the PXE Linux uh, default file uh, that we need to create as well as there's an LD uh, Linux.c32 file that we're also going to have to extract. All right, so to extract that uh, file system squash file, we can use this command unsquash fs uh, basically to decompress it and then write it to a directory of our choosing and it will literally like think of it as unzip the file and make it available for us to, to inspect raw. Uh, so this is how it looks if you uh, extracted that file somewhere in a location in your disk, basically it resembles like a the root folder of a Windows machine, uh, of a, it, it resembles a root folder of a Linux environment. Let's go on to syslinux. Syslinux in this case is also used to boot Linux uh, kernels, right? It's got a couple of, uh, you know, well-established external libraries and support, but it's most mostly used to boot Linux and, you know, all the peripheral processes of getting Linux started or any other operating system that supports this, this type of uh, setup. But we're actually going to download this massive archive. Well, not massive, but we're going to download this archive. We're going to extract one file from this that is required uh, just after that uh, LPXE Linux uh, image is loaded by the TFTP bootloader uh, and it's needed to kickstart off the subsequent change. But that, this file that we're going to extract is going to be the first one that's going to be uh, loaded using HTTP. We're going to go and locate this uh, LD Linux C32 file. We only want this one file. Uh, if you find if you com execute this command here, you'll see we find it in that location. We copy it and we put it in our um, TH TFTP server file location. Uh, next, we need to prep the file system dot squash fs with our um, you know reverse shell capability, so that we can actually have remote access to our to our uh, victim. To do, that, to do that, we need to add this file, the SOCAT utility to that uh, file system so that we can actually, you know, connect back. To do that, we extracted our uh, our file system .squashfs file, and if you remember, this is how it looks like. But now what we're going to do is we're going to edit this startup, you know, file uh, that is present in that look in this location. And we're going to just add this long string here, all right? And all it does is uh, it's a command for SOCAT to, you know, connect back to our location. Um, and we also need to copy the SOCAT bin uh, executable into a specific location as depicted there so that we, you know, can connect back. And um, all that's required now is to start our... Uh, our uh, reverse shell or our, our listener rather so that when the machine boots up it'll connect to this port for uh, quad four double four um, and then we can interact with our host our victim rather so next we take our modified uh, file system uh, and we repackage it back into a squash fs and uh, write it somewhere and then you know output it and put it back into our 
uh, TFTP file location or where our uh, web server, and actually more like where our web server is going to be uh, serving content from because the TFTP server is not serving this content, it's the web server. So basically, this uh, modified file system is now sitting here. Moving on. Okay, so in this location, you'll see now that there is our, our initial RAM disk image, unmodified, just copy directly from live image. We have our VM Linux or VM Linux file, which is our kernel file. And uh, these files are all gonna be served through HTTP through our web server. Everything is ready to go now. So we can, and we got all our tool, everything set up and let's boot our, um, our victim host. You'll notice that our victim host boots in to a uh, DHCP state when it's, this is the false, the the network actually, the network card actually uh, boot using boot P and DHCP etc. to actually boot an operating system. You'll notice it's retrieved that uh, PXE Linux image and it's actually now executing. And then you'll see there it is actually asking, uh, they will see it's uh, booting the, or it's retrieving the Linux kernel and well as retrieving the initial RAM disk image, um, which then you'll see here if you look at the web server, all the files that's actually being retrieved. So uh, LD Linux uh, CRT CR32 file being retrieved, and then the default config, uh, the, the config being retrieved, as well as the VM Linux kernel, as well as the initial RAM disk, as we just saw now. So to to put that into perspective, if you look at it from a Wireshark point of view, you'll see here's the lpexelinux.0 file which was served using uh, TFTP. Um, and that was the only file that was actually pushed out through TFTP through the DNS mask service. Um, all the other um, interactions, if you look in this Wireshark trace, is all through HTTP uh, with our Python web server serving the content. So if we zoom through the boot process of our Linux host now, so this is actually booting the Linux operating system uh, using the init RAM disk as the first base. And then you will see here, we are actually, our operating system is actually retrieving that file system.squashfs file that we modified as noted here and it's extracted it. And now it's basically replacing the initial RAM disk with this file system um, version and this becomes now the live operating system, of which that modified uh, gparted script is gonna kick in shortly after this, uh, finished executing. So here we'll see back at our web server, uh, we'll notice that uh, the file system, the squash file is being retrieved, and uh, that's what we just saw being extracted on the, at the victim's machine. So back at our, back at our uh, Netcat listener, we're waiting for the reverse shell to kick in, and once that uh, victim's machine's completed booting and it's reached that G part at script, we will have our sweet, sweet shell, uh, reverse shell, and we will be able to interact, voila. Now we see we are root, which is expected, and we have our network adapter. We see we've got a couple of IPs there. It doesn't really matter, but at least we know we've got some network connectivity, hence obviously the, the <laughs> reverse shell, but most importantly, we see there's a, a disk, a disk attached with a partition, which happens to be net uh, NTFS. And now we continue to mount that um, partition. So we're just gonna mount it like this, using the mount command onto the temp file location. And when we list that content, voila, we have a Windows uh, partition. Um, since this Windows partition is not encrypted using something like uh, BitLocker or any other full disk encryption technology, we have uh, full read-write access uh, at this stage and we can modify file system location, um, etc. Like we're gonna do now. We're going to write a little ransom note to our victim here and we're gonna do that in the startup menu location for that host or for that victim. So when they boot up, they will have a ransom note displayed uh, that they will need to uh, act on. Otherwise, you know, we're going to do bad stuff um, and we're going to just pop the calculator just to prove we got co code execution. So maybe that'll scare our victim into paying the, the ransom there. So when we boot up, the whole DHCP boot process was now modified to exclude the PXE boot image and our victim will now boot into its operating system 
as normal because there was no PXE boot image offered. So user logs in, uh, the you know get to the desktop and voila, the auto auto spawn or the auto start programs get executed. We see our we see our ransom note there and we see our code execution, i.e. calculator was popped. Whoop de do. We got uh, we got ransomed. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope this was insightful.